I never thought I'd talk to the law, finish up the floor, fresh out the shower. She's a goddess, manicured nails, pedicured toes. She's modest, clean hair when they're out there. Because of her beauty, she makes me scared. Oscar's dress, all red, reminds me of the best of our times. When I was rich, she was mine, we were one. At the rising of the sun, talking having the sun, talking making us one for the father and the son, talking black excellence. The Nefertiti to my pharaoh, the queen to my king, the royalty sin, memory within, everything we could have been, foolish. Nothing more than a memory. I never thought I'd see her face again. I never thought I'd see her face again. I never thought I'd see her face again. That was what's commonly referred to as the float. It's what makes a musician, a rapper, different from a normal person. The ability to understand a beat, to have your visual cortex and your hippocampus light up with memory, and to be able to create art and take people on an emotional journey and tell a story. That's what being a musician is. As well as being a musician, I'm an entrepreneur. And being a musician is what helped me get through an early life in South London that was difficult. I was signed to a record label last year whilst running my business. And I got to experience everything that comes with that. Attention, female attention. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the key things that happened is I got told what kind of music to make and how to dress and sometimes even how to talk. So for musicians, there's a definite choice in music today. You can be an independent artist and have nobody hear your music and not necessarily see any success. Or you can get told what to do by a record label. Or at least that's the way it was. Today, because of the digital revolution, because of advertising technology, because of social media, you have the ability to do what the late Nipsey Hussle did. Be an entrepreneurial musician. Chance the Rapper, J. Cole, Kendrick combining the two most beautiful things about the American dream, art and entrepreneurialism. That's what we've come to talk about today. Other than the flow, and also the flow itself, what allows these people to do these things? How can everyone in this room be able to be artistic and entrepreneurial? That's the question that me and Team BrainRap look to answer at MIT. How do we give the flow to you, and to you, and to you? Technology enabling music. So let's think about this for a second. Today, we have these things called mobile phones. We have Instagram, we have Facebook, we're super connected, we're messaging, we're talking, we're Snapchatting, we're doing all these things all the time. Yet we're further apart than we've ever been. And particularly for musicians, it's really difficult because reality has been replaced by the fantasy of social media. You know, if you're a musician and you're playing your local bar all the time and you see Taylor Swift or a big rapper making millions of dollars doing exactly the same thing as you, you start to question what the difference is between these people and you. They're doing exactly the same thing. That leads to depression for a lot of musicians. When I was signed, I got to talk to and spend time with other musicians, friends. And it depressed some of them that they weren't signed. It depressed some of them that they couldn't make money to support themselves. They were connecting with the image of me. My principal founding investor is here, Ken Lang, and he is who enabled me to be a serious, validated entrepreneur, a neuroscientist, a data scientist. But when I was signed, people only thought I was a rapper. He raps, right? 70% of musicians feel depressed. Some of these are my friends. 15% of musicians feel suicidal. The music industry is making $10 billion less than it did in 2000. And then when you combine that with like the smaller deals, that are being handed out by record labels and Spotify taking over in terms of streaming, 
That means it's more difficult than it's ever been to be a professional musician. Yet at the same time, these musicians see very successful musicians. So again, we come back to this question. What makes the chance of the rappers of the world, the Nipsey, so different to every other musician? And I'll tell you, the flow in knowing your audience, as well as the digital revolution. Right? So how do we take both of these things again and just give them to the normal person on the street? That was the focus of the project. Imagine being able to spend, as a musician, 10% of the time that you spend writing and recording and practicing, but be 90% more effective. 10% of the time creating a social media following, but to get a million followers. 10% of the time learning to be better at your craft, but being 90% better. That's the promise of this technology. That's the promise in the age that we live in. Neurocomputing wasn't around 10 years ago. Retargeting wasn't around 10 years ago. So that was the focus of BrainRap, to teach people to use 10% of their time, but be 90% better. And when you think about why some of these musicians can do what they do, it really comes down to that practice and something called rap science. This is the idea of crossing the bar line, or triplet flow, or all of the different things that we talked about, right? And to give you an idea of the differentiation between those things, it's what I did at the beginning on one side, the creative eyes who may be independent, and Versace, 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 Versace. Two different things, right? <laughs> so you see the difference between these two things is expressed in how people think, how a rapper thinks. Turning off self-edit, turning off subconscious flow. I just performed in front of you guys and I'm feeling good, right? That being given to a normal person using neuroscience. So to what you guys do, what we did, we, um, my team, BrainRap, Team BrainRap, we competed in the Reality Virtually Hackathon. This is the premier hackathon, literally on Earth, of VR engineers. MIT, Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, there's about 10,000 people that apply and 400 get in. And there, me and my team, which is mostly people of color, won the People's Choice Award for our work. So what was this? What, what was this project? I've talked enough about kind of the high level stuff. We'll get to some of the science. So the best way to think about this is three parts of the brain, right? The hippocampus, the visual cortex, broker's area. The hippocampus is responsible for memory. The hippocampus is responsible for phenol processing. It's the bit that allows you to remember stuff. So we created um, unsupervised and supervised machine learning algorithms that helped you be able to capture information from the hippocampus and also the visual cortex and broker's area. We were able to do this with two brands, which really helped us out. Neurable, which is an electroencography device, which allows you to project your thoughts into VR, and you'll see it in a second. And Emotive, one of the leading EEG companies in the world. And we used these two headsets to be able to create neural networks, which extracted information real time from my brain and allowed our team to break down its constitutional parts, which again is language and remembering lyrics, emotionally connecting with an audience, and arranging those words in real time on a beat. And we created a VR experience which would change dynamically based on what you were thinking. The reason that we did this is the neuroscience trifecta, which is non-adrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine, and to a certain degree, neuroempermanthine. These are a lot of big words, so I'll explain it. <laughs> the three things that that allows you to do is feel neutral, good, and bad. And if you're experiencing all of these things in front of a crowd, you get recall memory about how to perform directly to individuals. That takes a lot of confidence, and it's the technology to install that confidence using neuroscience into a normal person. This is what it looked like. So, as you can see, the Neurable is uh, extracting EEG information in real time, and it's being broadcasted into the performance environment while I rap. Again, we came um, uh, basically first place with the People's Choice Award, and we were also able to get some press off the back of this. Right after this uh, meme right here, <laughs> what happened was one of the judges, this was during the judging session, stepped in and he had no rhythm. And he walked up and he put the headset on and the words were appearing on the screen because his thoughts were being predicted. And then he started rapping in time with the beat. And he's never rapped any, you know. So, you know, on the spot that proved what we're doing. So this is cool, right? This is awesome, signed, story, all this stuff is great. But why does this matter? What does this mean? How does this relate to anything, right? 
I'm sure that somebody here took an Uber today to get here, right? Most of you probably use Facebook, some of you use Instagram, and some of you use Tinder. <laughs> and um, these are platforms which uh, machines at the beckon of people who run the platforms are using to make decisions, right? So, you know, with Tinder, for instance, Tinder has an algorithm that figures out faces, does facial recognition, and tells you who's a match for you and does personality analysis, right? A machine's making that decision. A person isn't making that decision for you. And then on Uber, you know, there's a zip code targeting and a number of other things, but a machine's making the decision about how much your Uber costs, and if you're in Harlem, whether you can even get an Uber within 10 minutes, which you get on the Lower East Side by default because of income segmenting, right? And then, arguably the most serious, I think Facebook, we know, has a lot of problems. <laughs> but very recently, the Housing and Urban Development Department took them to court. And they took them to court because, independent of any engineer at Facebook deciding this, off the back of zip code targeting and off the back of some employment filters, Facebook's machine learning algorithms were hiding jobs from people in the Bronx and Brooklyn. So I'll break that down as a story, because this is a storytelling-driven thing, right? <laughs> um, imagine that I am a college-educated, um, second-generation immigrant from the Bronx of Latin descent, say. And I use Facebook on a pretty regular basis. And I go onto Facebook after graduating college, let's say I went to Harvard. And um, I'm back in the Bronx, that's the important part. I live there, I'm geotagged there every single day, I post there, so Facebook knows that I'm there. And Let's say I want to apply to be an engineer, software engineer, a mechanical engineer, whatever, or a doctor, right? As I look for these jobs on Facebook, they don't appear to me. And then as we know, your behavior on social platforms affects everything you see on the rest of the web. So if I'm not seeing jobs on Facebook, it's assumed um, through what are called demand side platforms and other things, advertising things, that I don't need to see those jobs. So all of a sudden, because of a decision that a machine has made, on Facebook, I don't see employment opportunities, and my life changes, and maybe socioeconomically, it changes for the worst, right? That's the impact of machine bias. That is why we have put this project together. Machines, without human data present, make biased decisions. It's the kind of the basis of the P equals MP problem, a problem in computer science. So, you know, myself, Team Sentiment, the investor that we have, are aware of this problem. It's a difficult problem to tackle, it's a different problem to understand, but it has very real-world consequences for jobs, for many things. We're going into an age, the age of universal basic income and what we call the second machine learning age, where machines are going to start to make decisions about things like, well, they already make decisions about jobs, but prison sentences. Currently, there's a paradigm of called recidivism risk, <laughs> it's a mouthful, <laughs> where federal judges are advised by a machine as to whether a prisoner should go back to jail or not. And it was very recently understood that the intake form, as you go to jail, asks you where you come from, your generation, and where you grew up. And then it's just fed into a machine, and it makes a decision as to whether you should spend the rest of your life in prison. And because of the fidelity of the cases, judges are just taking the advice and going, you should go to prison now, without knowing who you are as a person, why, or even understanding the machine bias behind it, right? This also applies in the medical field, advertising, a number of places. So, coming back to the point, human emotion needs to sit in machine decision-making. Coming back to brain wrap, human emotion needs to sit in advertising data that drives record label and streaming decisions. Human emotion needs to sit in machines in the machine learning age, or things are going to change for the worst. That's why we created BrainRap. That's why sentiment exists. That's what we're trying to achieve, removing bias in machine learning. So I've said a lot of things, and I want to review them so everyone remembers what I talked about. So imagine, again, being able to spend 10% of the time you spend writing, and the time you spend recording, and the time you spend practicing, but be 90% more effective as a musician. Imagine as a doctor, 
being able to spend 10% of the time that you spend memorizing parts of the body, but being 90% more effective as a doctor. Imagine as a financier, being able to spend 10% of the time memorizing stocks or financial systems, but being 90% better investor. That's the power of the second generation of neurocomputing. The ability to take human data and optimize humans, and the ability to take human data and remove bias in machines. From a brain wrap perspective, what we're looking to do next is apply this to music therapy. A lot of the friends I had when I was signed, still my friends, regularly experienced depression. If they had access to this technology, they could support themselves. They could find their audience, and they wouldn't have to be signed. Imagine a Nipsey hustle everywhere. What I would like you to think about as you go home tonight is one, the fact that machines are making many of the decisions in your life and what that's going to mean for your children. Number two, the person next to you, their economic worth, their worth as a human being. This country was founded on the idea of equality. This country was founded on the idea of people being able to be people. This country was founded on the idea of democratization, of economic worth, and worth as human beings, as well as free speech. If only a small population understand the problem that I'm talking about, it will continue and get worse. Educate yourself on machine learning bias, because it affects you personally. And if there's some way that we can work together, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.